Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. So we just launched this year's Books We Love, NPR's guide to our favorite books this year. And going through this thing, a lot of fascinating people were the subjects of biographies. You know, you got Lou Reed, Ella Fitzgerald, Vince McMahon, Madonna. But biographer Jonathan Eig took on what is probably one of the most difficult jobs in the game, writing a new and interesting biography of Martin Luther King Jr., a figure who looms so large in our culture that it can be difficult to see him as just a guy, you know, as a person. And that was Ike's goal, to really get into all the parts that made King human. And in this interview with NPR Steve Inskeep, he talks about King's complicated relationship with his father. Because what could be more human than not get along with your folks? That's in a minute. This message is brought to you by Apple Pay. Fussing with plastic cards should be a thing of the past. Instead, pay the Apple way. Apple Pay is easy, secure, and built into iPhone. All you have to do is set it up. Just add a card in the Wallet app and you're good to go. This message comes from NPR sponsor Autograph Collection, part of Marriott Bonvoy. Each of the almost 300 independent hotels in the Autograph Collection are designed to be exactly like nothing else. Visit AutographCollection.com to find something unforgettable. The life of Martin Luther King is one of the most famous in American history. But in that life, one thing is easy to overlook. How young he was. King became a nationally known civil rights leader in his mid-twenties. When he gave the famous I Have a Dream speech in Washington in 1963, he was in his early thirties, though his voice suggested the gravity of long experience. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history. We know that cadence, the drawn-out words, precisely pronounced, the pauses between each phrase. The biographer Jonathan Eig found a recording of a voice with a similar cadence, one that King grew up hearing. It's an oral history of his father, Martin Luther King, Sr. When I was born in the midst of of segregation at its height. And I was able to see many injustices leveled upon my people. Jonathan Eig spends a lot of time on Martin Luther King Jr.'s youth in his biography, King, A Life. We learn that King's father grew up with a different name, Michael King, and adopted the name that his son later made famous. It was part of the father's self-invention after growing up as a sharecropper's son. He's working on a farm. His father and mother are stuck in poverty, unable to escape the white landowner in Stockbridge, Georgia. And Martin Luther King Sr. at age 12 walks barefoot out of Stockbridge toward Atlanta to make himself a new life and begins teaching himself to read and write, setting the groundwork to become a preacher, to become an activist, and to raise one of the greatest activists in American history. What did it mean that Martin Luther King Jr., unlike his father, was able to grow up in relative prosperity in a prosperous part of black Atlanta? One of Dr. King's friends told me that he thought Martin Luther King's was really exceptional in that he did not seem to be bruised by racism in quite the same way that so many of his peers were. He had a little bit of a buffer growing up on Auburn Avenue in Atlanta, growing up in this preacher's family. You know, he had a bicycle, he had a pet, he had a dog. He lived in relative comfort. And because his family was so prominent, he was able to see a lot more opportunity than, than maybe some other people who were going to school with him had at that time. What were some aspects of the father's character that deeply affected the son? Well, he was a very difficult man. He was very stubborn. He was violent at times. He, you know, he used the belt to spank his children in public, sometimes out in the yard. And if one of the neighbors came by and, and yelled, he'd spank that kid too. So he was a difficult man who set very high standards for all three kids. And he also really was overly protective. And and when Martin Luther King Jr. became the leader of the Montgomery bus boycott and his home was bombed, Martin Luther King Sr. was there the next day saying, you're coming home with me. I'm not letting you stay here in this kind of risk your life in this danger. Hmm. And uh, it was very difficult for Martin Luther King Jr. to stand up to his father. He struggled with that all his life. Is that something that affected his approach to people later on? It really did. One of the interesting things about King is that he's a protest leader who really does not like conflict. He is always going out of his way to avoid 
conflict with people who are his elders, for, who seem to be his superiors in some ways, people like uh, Roy Wilkins at the NAACP or A. Philip Randolph. And then that plays out too when he becomes um, a negotiator with presidents and he really um, doesn't like conflict. He has to push himself really out of his comfort zone to to argue, to debate, to really challenge some of the leaders of this country. I'm amazed at the amount of education this young man sought at such a young age, given that his father had had virtually none. Right. He skipped grades and went to Morehouse, you know, two, three years younger than most of his classmates, then went to seminary and went to um, get his doctorate at Boston University, always the youngest in his class. And his father really was against it. His father thought to be a preacher, you don't need all that education. Morehouse was enough, Daddy King thought. But Martin always wanted to exceed his father. He wasn't comfortable with the way his father preached. He didn't like the emotionalism. He didn't like that country-style preaching. And young Martin Luther King Jr. wanted to show that he could go beyond, just like most of us want to go beyond our, you know, our parents. Uh, we want to see what, you know, how far we can go beyond what they've established for us, right? How did King Jr. emerge as the leader of the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955? This is one of the miraculous moments in American history where the right person happens to be in the right place at the right time. And Martin Luther King Jr. was not looking to become a leader. He was looking to get his church um, in shape and perhaps move on to a, a bigger church or to a job as a, as a college professor. But when the Montgomery bus boycott began, they were looking for somebody who could serve as the spokesman. He wasn't even asked to become the president yet. He was just asked to be the, the spokesman because he hadn't been around long enough to make enemies. So people thought he might be able to unite the community and they already knew that he was a terrific speaker. So King steps up to the podium at Holt Street Baptist Church on December 5th, 1955 and, and gives this incredible speech. And it's the first time that most people in Montgomery have heard him. And suddenly he inspires them in a way that is just profound. They, they're ready to, to walk they're ready to march. They're ready to, to do it as long as required. If we are alive, the Supreme Court of this nation is alive. Yeah. 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 If we are alive, the Constitution of the United States is alive. Yeah. I'm just thinking of the pressure this person then faced in the years that followed. Seen as the representative in some ways of an entire race, under FBI investigation, under threat, under violent threat, repeatedly arrested, finally assassinated. What, if anything, in his youth prepared him to withstand that pressure? The Bible. I'd have to say it was his faith in God. Um, and he said it over and over again that um, God called on him to do this, that called on all of us to live up to the words of, of the teachings of in the Bible, that we're here to serve God. We're here to try to make the world a better place, and it's not about ourselves. And um, that's not to say he didn't feel the pressure. He was hospitalized for depression numerous times, and he suffered. He, he knew that his own government was out to destroy him. They were tapping his phones. They were uh, listening to his conversations in hotel rooms. He still did the work, and he still doubled down. He never backed off of, of his convictions. He, he stuck to what he believed in and was willing to risk everything for it. Jonathan Eig is the author of the new biography, King, A Life. Thanks so much. Thank you. The Hunger Games is a blockbuster book and movie franchise. It's now spawned a prequel called The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. That's in theaters now. Prequels can be a mixed bag, so we're here to tell you whether this one's worth your time. Find out on the Pop Culture Happy Hour podcast from NPR. This message comes from NPR sponsor GiveWell. Have you ever wondered where your donation could have the most impact? GiveWell was founded to help donors find evidence-backed organizations that are saving and improving lives. Donate at GiveWell.org. Pick podcast and enter NPR at checkout. This message comes from NPR sponsor Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. AI needs a lot of processing speed, and that gets expensive fast. Upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is the single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. Do more and spend less like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic. Take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com NPR.